part of the part of the message this morning was talking about that was Psalm 40. That was Psalms 40. We're not going to be in Psalms 40. We're going to be uh, we're going to be starting out in Genesis chapter 15. We're going to be talking about the steward of the house. One of the one of the things that I, and I think this is a principle that that we need to understand better is that, is that specifically for men. Well, no, it's not specifically for men. So I, was, I, I was thinking when you said that. I don't know what the steward of the house. Is. I haven't heard that term before, but I was thinking about the. I have learned in the past that you know, as the, the as the head of the household, that we're held accountable for you know for yep. bringing our family, you know, guiding our family to, to God, you know, as far as bringing them to, to Christ and and leading them in and all that. Yeah, you, you. I mean, you could probably apply this, but it has more to do with your relationship to the boss, to okay. God. Gotcha. It is really what we're talking about. You know, this morning I talked about you know, you know, taking your cross and and following him, but you know, carrying that cross also means that you're adopt, you're an adopted child into God, and He makes you a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Now, there's a there, you know, I really dumbed it down this morning, and That's I'm Romans eight, right? The joint joint heir with Christ. It is. Yeah. So tonight we're gonna. I didn't I really. I'd forgotten what. What tonight's message was about until I looked at it this afternoon. I'm like, oh, I preached half of it. I guess it was on my mind. That's why it came out. But uh, you are going to get the advanced version of that tonight. Okay. Right. So um, anyway, I'm going to open up a prayer and then uh, we'll we'll look in uh, Genesis chapter 15. And uh, we're going to be we're going to be in a couple different places. So if you want to if you want to mark some of these down, uh, these will be good verses for you too to 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 keep. And, uh, and I don't know if you know this or not, but I've been actually going on to like the, the YouTube page whenever I put the message on there. And I've been putting my outlines on there. Also, if you ever wanted to go and look at it for yourself and see what I'm talking yeah, about. That's you know, really helpful, especially when, you know, when you go back and listen to a message and you're not sure exactly where, where everything's at. That's really helpful to have all the books. Yeah, I'm putting almost all the information on there that, awesome. that I have. I just started doing that. Um, it seemed like a good idea, so. <clears throat> Excuse me, let's pray. Dear Lord, I just want to ask that you be with us tonight. Help us to understand uh, what you want us to be in this world. You, you've called us for a reason. You have expectations for us. Help us to be able to understand these things and to be the stewards that you would have us to be. Guide our hearts and our minds. Help us, Lord, to be the, the men that you want us to be and grow us in this understanding and faith. And help us to present your mercy and your witness throughout this whole world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So Genesis chapter 15, verse 2 and 3. Um, there, is a, there is a guy here. Abraham, you know, Abram, uh, we've talked about him. But uh, uh, God comes to Abram and Abram's concerned. He has no children. You know, this is even before Hagar... And God appears to him in a dream and tells Abraham in verse 1 that I am your exceeding, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me seeing I go childless? You see, Abraham, he, you know, he's, he's, just fought a, he's just fought a battle and he won the battle. And uh, he's more concerned about the future. For you know, for you know everything that's going on, and you know we all are, his right? Legacy, his legacy, you know. His, yeah, he's worried about you know what's going to happen to his what he's what he's accomplished in his life. He's wondering where that's going to go, you know, afterwards. You know, right there. You know, there's just something that God put inside of us that wants to that wants to like teach the next generation um, everything that we have to invest in them to. And you know, and that's and that's good. You know, that's that's called mentorship. And uh, and you know, and I hope you you know that you younger guys that you understand this. And as you grow in your life, that you you have people around you that you know you help influence them. That it's, it's not it's not you always being influenced by other people, but you put some influence into someone else. You invest in their life, and you and and you take you take hold of them and uh, and teach them godly principles you're gonna there's gonna probably be somebody in your life like that um are you gonna teach them godly principles or are you gonna teach them something else 
you know, that's that's probably what it's going to come down to. What are you going to do with with that gift when God gives it to you? Um, this Eleazar that he mentions is that the head thumping Eleazar, or is this a different one? This is this is a different Eleazar, okay. but uh, at the same time, this is <laughs> this is this is Abraham's military general. Okay? Okay, okay, so he just helped lead. He just helped Abraham lead his uh, his three hundred people into battle. Yeah, against uh, against who was the. It? Um, it it was a, a, I guess several kings who come who came together oh, against. Okay. Uh, that, that's when the the, battle of, that's when we see Melchizedek, right? Is it after that war? That yeah, when, yeah. Melchizedek shows yeah. up. Okay. Yeah. After they thump the heads. Yeah, it, it was really uh, Chedalamir uh, and his band of rogue kings who went. They were just kind of a band of just ruffians that went around, but they did have like control of territory. So uh, Eliezer here, um, God's most Abram is talking to God, and he says, "What are you going to give me, seeing that I go childless? The steward of my house is Eliezer of Damascus." And Abram said, "Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir." Mine heir. Uh, you know, one of the things that they found uh, they in in that area of uh, of of the Middle East, they found a lot of tablets, and part of the custom that they discovered there is that if somebody did, if that someone did have no heir in their house, they had no children of their own to inherit all their stuff, that they would adopt the the really the one who's in control of all their stuff. That that heir, Eliezer here, didn't have any relation to Abram. Actually, was a slave, sort of. Um, not a slave like you know we think as the chattel slaves, but these are these are slaves that are kind of invited into the family, and they're like us. This guy's like a son to Abram. Well, you, you know what's pretty amazing is when you think about how, you know, because this is a pretty elderly Abraham that we're talking about right now. Yeah. Um, and uh, and you know he's gone that long because I mean Sarah didn't conceive till after she was a hundred, right? Right. Okay. And then uh, you know he had had no children up to that point. And he's sitting here worried about his. You know his lineage. Yeah, right it's now. getting. He's, he's getting got, serious. God comes yeah. in and gives him this promise, and, and now we still have the children of Abraham as a as a major, you know, uh, influence on the world today. I mean, the, the Jews are still thriving right. and, and surviving, and you know, God's promises are great and true. You know, that's what we should take from that for sure. That he, when, when God promises something, it's going to happen. Right. Um, now, Eliezer did not receive. Was not the promised son that. That God was talking about. However, what I wanted you to glean from that is that it talks about Eliezer that he's the steward of the house. Like he's he's the one in charge of everything that's going on in Abraham's household. He, he I mean, he's got a family business. I mean, he's got three hundred men who are able to fight. Okay, that's that's what his community looks like. And this, and this, that day and age, that's a pretty big deal. Yeah, that's pretty, yeah, that's a force. That's a that's a pretty big community that he's got with him right there. I want you to look again with me in Genesis chapter twenty four. Kind of makes me wonder how he felt about the whole thing about living, you know, he was looking forward he might have been looking forward to that inheritance from Abraham. <laughs> you know. Maybe, you know, I figure I, I figure just know I mean we're gonna get some more information about Eliezer in a, in just a moment. But I think that he had the heart where he just wanted to do well, his job to, to the best of his ability. He was he was faithful to Abraham. Yeah, he was he was there for Abraham to do whatever he needed to do. In Genesis chapter twenty four, we have a very unique situation come up. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to read the first ten verses. It said, and this is about Eliezer. It doesn't say his name here, but he is the he. We know from that past chapter. This is only a few years down the road. Uh, that this is this guy is still still here and he's doing a work how, for Abraham. How old is Isaac in this passage when, he, when they're looking for his wife? Uh he's probably he's probably close to forty. Okay, so he, he's he's up there. So this so this has been forty years since that promise you know, or, yeah. or more. Yeah. Right. But okay. I was wondering how much time has passed. So. Yeah. But you also have to under people lived a little bit longer during these days. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, not not an extreme amount, yeah. uh, but well, a little uh, bit longer. How many generations is there between Noah and Abraham? 
Just a couple. Just a couple. I didn't think it was much, right? Yeah. And then I know Abraham and Noah. Noah, Noah was the grandson of Methuselah. And Methuselah was always first in the Bible. Yeah. Right? When Abraham is around, Noah's still alive. Yeah. Yeah, they cross each other. Yeah, yeah. they cross a little bit. In fact, in fact, Noah is still alive even when Isaac is, is around. Really? Wow. So, that's amazing. So that I mean that's why that's why I think that Melchizedek is Noah. That that's why because he's. Oh, I didn't know. I, I'm talking. sorry, not Noah, not Noah. Seth. I'm sorry, Seth. Seth. Noah's Seth. Son, yeah. yeah, Noah's not alive. Seth is still alive. Yeah. So really, there's just you know there there's still a generation that's there from the flood that went through the flood. Yeah. So it's anyway, I'm sorry. All, yeah, all these people, all these people that we talked about are, are just like one or two generations removed from, from the right, flood. Right. So, I mean, it's all from the same family. So. Yeah. I. I Right off the top of my head, I can't remember if Noah is still alive when Abraham is alive or not. If he if he's not, he just died. Yeah, it's, it's really close. They are Shem is still alive. A little bit, yeah. yeah. His kids are definitely alive. Yeah. yeah, Abraham is actually around during the during the Tower of Babel. Wow. So I mean, that's that's kind of where we're at. I know it's hard to like put piece all yeah, this together. That's that's one of my struggles with the Old Testament is kind of understanding the timeline on mm -hmm. that because it is pretty complicated because there's so many different tangents, right. you know. So. I was, I was trying to figure out where I'm at you know, all right. on the line. <laughs> well, let's let's get this rabbit back on the sorry, track. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's all right. That's all right. Probably good stuff there. Uh, we're talking about Eliezer. I believe we're talking about Eliezer anyway. Okay. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had. See that? He ruled over everything that Abraham had. <clears throat> and I... Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thumb, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go into my country and into my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. So we see that Abraham admits, you're in charge of everything that I have. I even want you to go pick a wife for my kid. Okay. I mean, that's, that's how much... This is how much control this guy has. Abraham's 140 and Isaac's 40. Okay. I'm sorry. I was reading that. Uh, yeah, so, something like that. So this guy, yeah. you know, if it's not Eliezer, it is. Well, the commentator in this Bible thinks it is, too. Yeah. yeah. I, so we have we have this going on, and he so he he promises Abraham, and you can go through the rest of the story if you want. I, I want you to see Abraham trusts this guy to go find a wife for his son. He's in control of everything, even his son. All right, Isaac's not in control yet. His son has more has more authority than I'm sorry. This this servant has more authority than even his son Isaac at this time. Yeah. So, doesn't, doesn't he tell him to go back somewhere and get a wife for him? That's like somewhere. Yeah, he goes he goes back to Haran, and he finds. Um, he finds a wife, um, Rebecca, I okay. believe is her name. He finds Rebecca, and you know, he and he goes back. He and he doesn't go back empty-handed. He goes back looking like a rich guy. Well, okay. what's, what's really cool too is that you see what Abraham passed down to Eliezer here, because Eliezer, in finding Rebecca, he uh, he does it by going to the God. He prays for God to give him the sign of which. Which woman it is. So, yep. so this this person trusts in God is just as much as Abraham does. Right. This person is is faithful, you know, and that's that's a, uh, you know, I think that's a pretty in, in, interesting aspect, you know, that you're talking about, you know, our legacy and how we pass it down. And, you know, what, what are we going to pass down to the next generation? How we're concerned with that, you know, <coughs> Abraham obviously, obviously invested in this person, and, right, and took them in as a son. Right now, now this is, and, and you know, and that's part of that mentorship, you know. Because our job as, as, when you understand who you are in Jesus Christ, you're not a slave. You're not just a servant in this world, but you are an heir of Jesus Christ. Heir of the kingdom. And heir of the kingdom. And you, it is part of your job to make sure that you make the next generation and you help the next generation know who they are in Christ Jesus. Because there's only one way that they're going to know, and that's if you tell them. Because one day, I'm not going to be here. I mean, I get it. Right now, I'm telling you. But there's coming a day when I won't be able to tell anybody anymore. And who's, and who's that leave? Well, tag. You're it. You're, you're going to be the guys. 
And you have to say, I'm gonna, I am, I am willing to accept that responsibility. And we should care as much about that responsibility as we do the, the things that we care about in this world, about passing on, you know, whatever to our kids, and you know, passing like our, our, our money and our legacy and our, you know, our physical things to our kids. We should care even more about, you know, if we're heirs of the kingdom, then that means we're, we're, you know, we're brothers and sisters of Jesus. You know, we're we're not just. You know, adopted kids that are put in the corner. We're we're given the title under God's it, absolutely God's right, kingdom. and and you want that legacy to continue on yeah. because it's not just about inheriting this earthly stuff, but it's about inheriting the promise. Yeah. That is that is what and Eliezer he knows this. Yeah. He's like this is about a promise that God gave to Abraham, and all of a sudden, I'm in, he's in charge. You know, he would say, I'm in charge to make sure that that legacy continues on because I got to I got to make sure that I find a compatible person for the promised seed, for the promised one, for somebody that's God's son really is what we're talking about. So that that's what that's what he's doing. And he and he is standing in that gap between Abraham and Isaac looking for the right person for Isaac. And that's and that's what you're and that's where you're going to be. And he's doing that because Abraham was too old to travel and stuff at right. that point, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So he's he is you know he's actually he's being a father to to, to Isaac basically. He's taking right. over that role as a steward. So we, we have we have Eliezer that he is the steward. He is the servant of Abraham. That's what it says. Uh, he's the he's the eldest servant of the house. That's now. The picture of Jesus. Now I want you now I want you to turn with me to Mark chapter 9 and verse 35. I think I just put the, put the pieces together what you're saying here. Mark what? Mark 9. Yeah, Mark 9 and verse 35. So here we have an example. If you don't know the Old Testament, you're probably not going to understand this part of the New Testament. So, Mark 9 and 35. Anybody want to read that? Okay, read aloud. And he sat down and called the twelve and saith unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. All right, so Jesus, he reaches back into this servanthood and he says, If you want to be the first, if you want to be like Eliezer, you want to be first in the house, you are actually the servant of all. Servant leadership. Yeah. Now, let me. I want to. I want to just kind of give you some of my own personal testimony. Uh, when I was in the Air Force, that is what I practiced. I practiced servant leadership. I never asked anybody to do anything that I wouldn't be willing to do myself. If I asked them to clean a toilet, it was because they needed. Because I've cleaned my own toilets. And I would go in there and clean it myself had I not had been the person who has to make sure that everybody has to do something, that they've got to do their job. Would I go clean a toilet? I would. Would I go in there and clean a toilet? I have. And I've cleaned up some pretty nasty ones. Yeah, I, I clean the toilet up front at work. It sucks. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, nasty, man. <laughs> you know, what, what you're looking at is you're looking at servant leadership. And, you know, and this, and this applies in your house. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna revert this to manhood for a second because a lot of men think I don't clean toilets, I don't clean bathrooms. That's women's work. That's women's work, right? Servant leadership means that if there's a job that needs to be done, you're willing to do it. Now, does it mean that you're gonna do it very often? Probably not. And but you know, understand the gap when it needs to. Bathroom is the smallest room in the whole house. <laughs> there you go. You see, that's the that's the that's the right attitude. You know. Well, I'm okay with taking out the trash. That's easy. <laughs> I say washing dishes and clothes, man. Yeah. But what do you understand? What I'm saying? Servant leadership means that you know you're willing to do what you what's most would be considered the most well, menial. And Jesus task. gave us that example. You know, Jesus, the Son of God, the ruler of the universe, bowed down on his knees and washed the feet of the man he knew was going to kill him. Or, or portray him. right you know and that that's the picture Jesus gave us there there's your example you know is that we should be willing to do 
You know, it's like it says, I forget what scripture it is, but you know, to present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, for that's your reasonable service. You know, yeah. you know, and that's uh, Jesus. Jesus did more than a lot of people are willing to do. Yeah. You know, most of us aren't willing to, to bow down on our knees in front of other men. And, and this, this, you know, Jesus being who he was, you know, showed us that humility. You know, yeah. we're supposed to have. And I yeah. fall short with that daily. I mean, I yeah. struggle with that myself. So. Well, when you have a, when you have a baby in the house, that that helps you be become more humble. Oh yeah. Because somebody needs to change that Joker's diaper. And there are, and you know, and I know, I know people that they're, they're like, like, they're like, I'm not changing the baby cycle. Yeah. I'm not doing it. Well, I know guys that refuse. They will not do it. That's not their job as far as how they see it. Yeah. Servant leadership. That is, that is, is, that attitude is antithetical to what God's commanded us to do. Yeah. And, and you know, and that reflects, that reflects some other things in in your house. That's what's going on. Do you have to like it? You don't have to like it. No. And if you want to get out of it as much as you can, you know, I understand. Oh, yeah. That's why we work 12 hour days. So we don't have to carry any diapers, man. <laughs> <laughs> but we're talking, about, we're talking about the servant of all, even down to the smallest of us. That's what we're talking about. And you, what, what would, what would the, the lead servant in the house do? Well, he's in charge of everything. He's got to make sure that the job's done right. And a lot of times, you, you know, you've got to train them. You know, I don't know how many times I've gone in there and trained the boys on how to do a job, and they, and you know, they continue to act like, oh, we don't know how to do it, or they purposely don't do it right. I'm like, well, you know, they can keep doing that for a long time, but one day, there's gonna come somebody in their life, and uh, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna have, they're gonna have some words with them, and uh, the refusal to do menial tasks may mean the loss of a marriage or a relationship with somebody, and. You know, God gave you skin that cleans you know, up. I've okay? actually, no matter how I've actually heard uh, men try to use scripture to justify that type of attitude towards their wives. And I just think that's about the most un, un-biblical thing you can do is to act like that, you know, towards your towards the person you pledge yourself to before God. Um, but the, I, I have heard that, you know, well, you know, God put put man over the head of the household. So you, that's woman's work. That's not my job. You know, I've actually heard that from some people who who claim to be God fearing people. Yeah. You know, that is not a God fearing attitude at all. Well, it's we're just we're just talking about servant leadership and God is. What does it mean to be the steward of the house? Well, it means that you do some nasty jobs, but it also means that you're in charge of the whole house. Of everything, the kingdom. Yeah. Look with me in Matthew chapter twenty-five, and uh, there's quite a bit here. It's a it's a whole parable. I'm going to read this parable to you. It's in Matthew twenty-five. <clears throat> yeah, Matthew chapter twenty-five. What verse? Are we We're going to start in verse fourteen. It flows pretty quick. Yeah. It's the parable of the talent. It says, and and it begins like this: The kingdom of heaven is as. Okay, when it says is as, what does that mean? It's like. It's like it's a simile. My my Bible actually says the stewardship stewardship of talents is the title of this section. So. Yep. So you so now that's that's what mine says too. Uh, it, it it does apply to this. So the kingdom of heaven is like this. Okay. It, what does that mean? What does the kingdom of heaven mean? It, come on, Michael. What do you got? What does the kingdom of heaven mean? Nothing. Nazik. What do you got? Yeah, it's how God works in the affairs of mankind. Because the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said, it's not a place that you go. It's not a physical thing, but it's what is put inside of you. It's it's what's on your heart. It's what God is doing in, in you. Okay? That's what he's talking about, the kingdom of heaven. And he's saying, if the kingdom of heaven is inside of you, this is what it looks like. Okay? So we're he's going to paint a picture of us. And he says... It's as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. So we, here we have servants that they are given all the master's stuff, all of his money he's putting into their hands. And unto the one he gave five, to the other two, and to another one, to every man according to his several abilities. So he looks at these guys and he's like, you can probably handle five, you can handle, uh, you can handle two, and you can handle 
one, you got you guys together have everything that I have according to your ability. Then he that received the five talents in verse 16 went and traded with the same and made them five other talents. And likewise, he that had received the two, he gained another two. <clears throat> but he that had received the one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoned with them. There is a day of reckoning. The master is going to come back and he's put you in charge of some things. And he's like, all right, show me what you did with what I gave to you. So he that had received the five talents came and brought another five talents and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five. Behold, I gained five besides the five talents more. His servant said unto him, and I'm sorry, his Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over to a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Okay, remember, this is the steward of the house. This is the servant of the house. The master has given him everything that he has, among, and he's divided it amongst three guys. And what does he say? You have been faithful in what you have done. Look what he says to the second. And he that received the two talents came and said, Lord, this is verse 22, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents besides them. And his Lord says unto him, just like the first, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Then he which had received the one came and said, Lord, I know thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strong. And I was afraid, and I went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, th there thou hast that is thine. And the Lord said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, Thou knewest that I reaped where I sowed not, and gathered where I have not strong. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should receive mine with, um, with usury. So what do, we, what do we see with this guy? He was not faithful. That's, that's what we see in this servant. He wasn't really a servant. He did nothing. He took, he took a gift and he buried it. He didn't use the, he didn't use what he was doing <coughs> in the way that he was made to. Was, um, you know, that's, that's the same with us, you know, just the picture of, you know, it, it really hit me this morning in, this, in the sermon where you were talking about, you know, the idea that you don't even own your own house and you've got to pay it off and still have to pay taxes on it. Mm -hmm. You don't own anything and that, you know, that, and, and, and how we, we look at things that we have in this life like they're ours, but really, end it's going to return to the one who gave it you know just like the scripture says about our right. souls you know, like it, it all belongs to god it's his and he is he has made us stewards over what we have in this life and, and we're supposed to use it for what he you know his for his his command what he got the, the missions he's given us to do you know? right and and you know and that's what it is you are given a mission if you are if you are really a believer then you're going to take you're going to take whatever God has given you, and you're going to try to use it to the best of your ability for Him. You know, is it going to be is it going to be super extravagant? Well, the guy who had two, well, he just he just gained two. But the point is that he tried. You know, if this, but I notice think the guy with five and the guy with two got the got the same reward. They got the same reward. I think if the guy who had the one, if he came and said. Well, I, I tried to use it, but I ended up losing it instead. But I did my best. And you know what he would have said? He would have said, you're faithful because you tried. But he didn't even try. And you know, and if you're a father, if you, whenever you, it doesn't matter if you're a father. If you're a friend to somebody and you're trying to help someone out and you know, you know this will work, but they look at you and they're like, that's too much work, and they don't even try. What do you do with that? Well, you're going to become angry just because they didn't even try. They didn't even give it a chance to fail. Like That's God, what this guy did. God does the same with us. He gets mad. Now look at the, look at these final verses on here. <clears throat> he takes in verse twenty eight. He says, "Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath the ten talents." Mm -hmm. All right, so. We've got, we've got something there. 
God looks at your stewardship. He sees you're serious about kingdom work. You're serious about serving God. And God has given everybody opportunities. Mm -hmm. But those who fail the kingdom. Or refuse to try at all. They refuse to try. God says, I'm going to take what gifts and talents I've given it to them. And I'm going to give them to someone that I know will use them. So you can lose your talents. You can lose your yeah. gifts. You know, and, and you know, and that and that's something that you see from the Holy Spirit, the gifts that come with the Holy Spirit. That just because you're like, well, I'm no good at public speaking. Well, there's some guys out there, they're really good at public speaking, but they're not using it for to honor God. They're not using it to glorify Him. God can take that from them and He can get He can give you whatever you need to get the to make the mission happen. To make his to to advance his kingdom work. There's, there's plenty of examples in throughout scripture of men who were not public speakers who became preachers and you know ambassadors of the Lord, you know, carrying the gospel. Yeah. Well you're someone standing in front of you is a good example of that. I was never a good public speaker. I was never I don't think I was good at very many things. But God but my in my adventure to, you know, serve God better, he's really he's really done some marvelous things. Um, I used to when when I was Isaac's age, I, I couldn't even I couldn't even play the piano, especially now, in front of people. Kick all those ivories. Yeah. Now I, I mean I I I've taught I've taught him, which is well, that's I'm the, like that, see, but that's that's the example. God gave you a gift of being able to play. You know, He gave you the the, the time and the ability or whatever it was. He He made it possible for you to learn to play, and you pass that down to your kids. Now you've got you know future church leaders down here who who are able to use that gift. You know. Right. right, and yeah, and you know, and, and that's just you know, that's just the heart of the kingdom to just to just reach it all. Yeah. Look, look what else it says there in the final verses here. It says, "For unto everyone that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. And from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath." Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. That God looks at you, He gives you just a little bit. Do you know what God's will is for your life? You know, that's a question. Tons of people ask, they're like, I just don't know what God's will is for my life. You know, he's told you a couple things that you know for sure. He says, keep his commandments. He tells you to go to church. He tells you to, to, try, to try to be godly and holy in your life. And you just take those few things. Maybe you don't understand a whole lot about the scriptures, but you take those few things and you do your best with them and watch God give you more things. He know. gives you understanding and advances you that way. Go ahead, Brother. If you, ever, if you ever wonder what the meaning of your life is or what God wants you to do it, you read uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 at the end of uh, chapter, uh, at the last two verses of the book. Um, you know, Solomon, King Solomon, the wisest man ever lived, he summed up his life right here. It says, The duty of man, let us hear now the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Yep. So, so there it you, is. you take the that small thing and you just build on that. And you're like the guy with the five talents. And God says, I'm just going to pile on you more and more and more and get you through. Does it mean that you're going to be a millionaire? That's not. It doesn't mean that you're going to be a millionaire. But it does mean... You might be, though. You might be. But, I mean, it just doesn't mean well, that. I, I don't think there's a lot of faithful millionaires, but there, there are a few. There are a few. Because, you know, like, like Jesus said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get to heaven. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know. Now see, now see this final point. What, what happens to this guy who was a very horrible servant? Basically, he was not a servant. He was really more like a, um, you know, he, he was that guy who gets paid for doing nothing. Yeah. He was a, 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 false, a false employee. He wasn't yeah, he was, he was not really an employee. He, he did nothing for the boss. He was an undocumented worker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Yeah, we know that. Yep, yeah, he was not faithful. He was a liar. He did not serve the master. He served himself because of what? Fear. And you notice fear. Yeah. Fear. And the fear was unsubstantiated. He had no reason to be afraid. Now, 
whenever you, if you can see yourself in this, and I'm going to go through these last ones pretty quick, but you see the transformation from this servant, this servant mentality, to the sonship. In John chapter 12 and verse 26, if you want to turn there, John 12, and uh, the next three verses are going to be right behind each other in John. John 12, 26. <clears throat> Jesus is speaking here. He says, If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. So you see the heart of the servant? The servant is going to follow the master. He wants to do what the master says. He knows what's going on. I'm going to follow him. Where he is, that's where I'm going to be, and I'm going to do what he asked me to do. And it says the Father, God, honors that effort, even if you're horrible at it. Does that make sense? Because there's training, there's getting better, there's mistakes that, may be, that are going to be made. God's all right with your mistakes. Mistakes are not God's problem with you. Your lack of initiative and want to is the problems. Does remember, that make sense? Remember, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. Yeah, there, there is a training ground. The Just think about the disciples. How good were those guys? At the beginning, horrible. <laughs> they were pathetic. <laughs> yeah. You know, they didn't understand why Jesus was there. We, I, I think the Chosen does a very good job of illustrating the disciples don't have a clue what Jesus is doing. They think it's about an earthly kingdom. Uh, it was I, never. And it amazes that. me how many times you hear them talking with Jesus, and they just don't. They just flat out don't understand what's going on. They don't understand what's going on. It, it happens so often. You know, they have a they have an idea in their head of what's supposed to be going, what Jesus is doing, but they don't really see. They don't ever really listen to what he's telling them. You know. Right. So, they they just don't get it. And you know there is a, there is a learning curve, and Jesus never got mad at them for the learning curve. Yeah. He just helped them take that next step. Even if they fell down as soon as they stepped. Now, he did show disappointment sometimes in them. You know, like when, they, when they fell asleep, when he wanted them to pray with him, you know, he was kind of upset about yeah, that. Yeah, he was, he was trying to teach them, you know, and it was an emotional time. Imagine what he was going through in his yeah. But away. even at that, yeah, still he, he still loved them. He didn't reject them. They, and they had a ministry later on, and they became much better prayer warriors after that. Yeah. Look at John chapter 13 and verse 16. Just uh, probably another page over. 13, 16. John 13, 16. Okay. And Micah, you want to read that? Read it loud. 13, 16. Yeah, John 13, 16. Early, early, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that is sent. So the servant is not greater than the Lord, neither he that is greater than he that sent him. So Jesus is saying, it's like, guys, we're basically, we're not even greater than each other. Do you, you, you get that from that verse? Yeah. Look at John chapter 15 and verse 15. Very unique. Anybody back in the back want to read that? You want to read it, Caden? Yeah, read it loud. 15, 15. Yeah, John 15, 15. Henceforth, I call you not servants, but servants. So here, Jesus, who is the master, who is the Lord, he's like, he says unto his disciples, he's like, you guys are not servants. Am I teaching you? Yes, but you're my friends. Okay? My brothers. Brothers. Yeah. People, we have common, we, we you know, we both... We, we're basically we're we're both under the same blood. That that's kind of what he's what he's referring to those guys. Look in First Corinthians chapter seven, twenty one and twenty two. First Corinthians chapter seven. Hmm. Isaac, you want to read that one? Read aloud. Seven twenty one. Yes, yeah, seven twenty one and twenty two. He that has called you Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free. Why 
that's why it's also he that is called to be free. So here the Apostle Paul, he reaches back and he says, Art thou called being a servant? He's like, yeah, you're, you're a servant. But he's like, I didn't call you to be a slave. I called you to be free. I wanted to make you free, to, to make you free. So, yeah, you were in bondage, but now. But like he says in 23, you're bought with a price. You're bought with a price. So you were, you were, paid, you were ransomed out of your bondage. Right, right. Be not the servants of men. Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. You want to take that on, Jacob, or you want me to read it for you? Galatians 4, verses 1 through 7. Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Yeah, it's not very long. <laughs> So this morning, this is the this is the reference that I was really reaching for, that God, Jesus called, he he said to his disciples, he's like I I didn't call you to be servants to me, I called you to be friends, but even more than that, I called you to be free men, according to First Corinthians chapter seven, he says, you know, don't, that's not your job to be a slave, but you're a free man. Don't think that you're a slave to the law. But God puts that in your heart because now you're not just you're not just a friend, but now you're adopted into the family. Abba, what does Abba mean? Daddy. It means daddy. That's the personal recognition of God, where it's like he's not just father. It's not a, it's not a formal father. You know, it's like it's a term of endearment. Yeah, it's a, it, it is the it is the it is the term term of uh, of an of endearment and you know if you've got you know you probably have uh, someone who's a father to you and most of you you're gonna look at him you're gonna like you're gonna call him dad right when you're but if you talk to someone else well who's your father well he's my father but when I'm speaking to him most people don't don't go around with the general with the generality as a father will you help me that's you see that in the movies right I don't know it bothers the mess out of me because it's like it shows a, a separation between their relationship, right? But if they call him dad or daddy, that there's, it's a lot more personal. There's a lot more relationship there rather than, well, that's the guy that, that gave me my blood, but I really don't have any other connection with him. But whenever, but whenever you, so you call him daddy, it's like, he, all, all of his, he has taught me well all of his bad habits, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that's that guy. So, and so for, for God, when he looks down, he's like, I have made you, I've adopted you. You are not a slave. You are my son. And it, what does it say there? Wherefore, in verse 7, wherefore thou art no more servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. And, uh, and he, he, Paul takes it even further in Romans where he says that children then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Right. You know, that, the first time I read that verse, it really, really hit me hard that, that you know, how God reaches down into the muck and mire and pulls us up out of it as a sinner, washes us up, brings us into his house, feeds us, clothes us, and then not only lets us have a room in his house, he sets us up on a throne next to Christ. And it's, 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 it's the 
epitome of grace. I mean, grace, it's, it's, it's unmerited favor that's being just poured out on us. Right. That we don't deserve, you know. And, uh, and our, our reaction to that ought to be faithful service to the Lord. Right. You know, that is one when you look at somebody, you don't, you, you try to look through God's eyes that he values everybody equally. That they're worth something to, you know, how, how to, the, to the one. Mean? Yeah, how does Jesus view them? Right, to the, and you know, and James, he really talks about that. He says, you guys, y'all struggle with putting certain value on some people and lesser value on others. When really God looks at them all the same, from the richest to the lowest. You know, that lady that was out there this morning. In Christ, there is no Jew or Gentile. They're all the same. Right, they're that, all the same. That identity, in, you know, our identity is Christ now. Yeah. It's not anything else. You know that lady this morning, she said that she'd been to several places and they rejected her and told her she needed to just leave. And she's like, I, I'm just glad that you guys helped us a little bit. You know, and, and we weren't just trying to help her just because, you know, that's the right thing to do. But it's like, you know, there's certain compassion there knowing that she's made some really bad decisions in her life. But which of us haven't? We've all right. been there. You know, she just happened to fall off the road where she was at. You know, we were just lucky enough somebody was kind enough to guide us back onto the road. Yeah, you know, and, and I mean, she could take she could take it for what it's worth on that. But it's, you know, that's, you know, and I get it. We can't we can't save everybody. But, but they come to us asking. For but that. if they if they're put in front of you, you do your best that you can with the tools that you are given. Sometimes you don't have the tools. To do it and you can't like you're like you just can't you're not the right person to do the job don't get upset if you're not the right person to be able to do the job you know pray for that person and like hopefully somebody will get they will come in front of somebody who has the right tools to help them or help find them somebody who can if you, if you can't do it you yourself, you can do you could do your best yeah try you know at least try like you said don't bury it in the ground at least yeah try. don't bury it don't <laughs> bury it even if it turns out to be an utter failure, don't bury it. God actually blesses failure. What does the scripture say? Though a righteous man falls seven times, what does he do? He gets back up. What, how many times did he mess up? Seven. How many times did he get back up? Seven. How many times did God forgive him? Seven. Every single time. How many more times will we forgive him? Every time. Every single time. And that's that's the difference between the servant and the son. The son. Yeah. How, what, what can you do to not be a son or a daughter of God? Once you're a son or daughter of God, you're going to be a son and daughter of God. Just like, you know, I, we went down to that funeral. I couldn't disown my boys. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Yeah, I couldn't disown them. It's like people, I didn't, I didn't say that, oh, oh this is mine. No, they came up to me and they told me that they were mine. What, a, what does that mean? That means that there's something, there's some, there's some of their father in them. Yeah. Even if they're, they're and, and, and I can testify, they're pretty bad at being me. Yeah, yeah it's, kind of, it's kind of an interesting way to look at soteriology, you know, as, as far as uh, if once we're saved, we're adopted into the family and we've become children of the Lord. There's, you don't you can't undo that that can't be undone right. you're always related by blood to your father no matter what you right. do you know yep. no but matter you, how hard you try there's no denying you know that you're connected yep but you can be the liar yeah you can be that false servant yeah, that buries that buries God God's gifts into the yep. ground and never use it one final thought if you realize that you are the son that you're the that you are the steward of the house. That's what God has called you to. You recognize that's your calling. You accept it in your life, and you, you just want to do your best. Be diligent. I want to share with you Luke chapter 12 and verse 42. Just a, just a couple of verses here. Luke 12. <clears throat> Luke 12. Gotcha. Verse 42. I'm going to read about five verses here. <clears throat> And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he, when he cometh, shall find so doing. 
of a truth, I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But, and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and the maidens, and to eat and to drink and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him asunder, <laughs> and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Okay? Their portion is with the unbelievers. Why? They didn't believe. Okay? Even though they called themselves a servant, they were not. They were actually an unbeliever. And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him much shall be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. So Jesus, he really digs in and he says, I've called you to be faithful stewards of my house, wise. Does that mean you're perfect? It does not. But if you're like, ah, oh, God will just forgive me. He, he doesn't really look at my life and, and, and judge me. You know, uh, once I'm saved, always saved. And, and, you, and that's, that's the highlight of your I life. Got fire insurance. Yeah, you got your fire insurance. That's not the thought of the wise and faithful servant. That's, that's not the attitude of, yeah. of a child of God or a child of the master at all. Yeah. Final thoughts. All right. If not, Brother Austin, would you dismiss us? Lord, we're so grateful we can be in your house today and we can come and learn more about you, Lord. We love you. We praise you. Lord, help us to carry your word out to our, in, out in our lives, Lord, so that we can reach others. Help us to be good and faithful servants, Lord, and collect souls for you. Help us to to carry out the Great Commission and, and just in your word.